I think we'll start this out with an example. You the filter chain is you're going to have a pass. I'm a bit loud. You grab by the function. Yeah, I mean, we're funny, but not always a As you might have guessed, it's another episode of Behavior Beast. Surprise, surprise. Um, we're kind of going back to basics a little bit today because we're moving back to the beginning of some of the stuff that we probably should have covered a long time ago, but don't ask why. Uh, there, there was actually a plan as to why we didn't cover this early on, but um, we're going to get into it now. So why don't we talk a little bit about experimental design, experimental concept, um, talk a little bit about methodologies and things like that. So uh, welcome out here and uh, let's talk about what... <laughs> what it is we need to know in order to get where we're getting. So I need to, I have a hard time talking about this topic, not because I'm confused by it. This is actually my area that I really love the most um, or have the most training in, so to speak. But, um, but because there's like two different pieces to experimentation and I don't think it's well delineated in the various textbooks. One of the things that you need to know is that the applied world versus the experimental world are two different things. You can do experiments in the applied world. That's a lot of what I've done throughout my history as an academician and um, done, done my work in, but you lose control, right? And you lose experimental control. We'll talk about experimental control in a minute. But in, so that's the applied setting. In, in, the, in the laboratory, in an experimental setting, you might have a basic question that you're trying to answer. You don't have to answer that question with animals and rats and pigeons and, or, or other non-humans. You can answer it with human animals as well. Some people think that all, like, all um, work in the laboratory is done just with, with rats and pigeons, and that's just a bunch of hooey. I mean, I've done plenty of work in the laboratory with humans, um, and not in a sort of naughty way, which leads us to kind of that distinction, right? It's really about the research question that you're asking. A lot of times when we're in an experimental setting, in a laboratory type setting, or when we're designing an experiment per se, we are really worried about experimental control. Experimental control is literally the ability to minimize the influence of extraneous variables. Right? So what's an extraneous variable? Well, there's a lot of names for them. Confounds, concomitant variables, extraneous, whatever. There's anything that can come and mess with your experiment. So what do I mean by mess with your experiment? I mean this. I mean mess with the ability or interfere with the ability for you to determine what is causing the effects that you see. So your experimental design and your experimental control that is developed out of the, sorry, there's bugs out here like crazy. I'm like, ah, I'm getting eaten alive. Um, anyway, so that has a bit of a confound on my ability to deliver a good lecture. I'm just scratching my face off, so or my neck off. So you get the idea, right? So that is a confound, and the irony is, is that it really does itch like crazy, and normally they don't bug me. So when, when we're talking about experimental control, what we're really talking about is the ability to minimize confounds. And what do the confounds influence? They influence your ability to determine what is causing the results that you see. So if you have a really nice design, like an ABAB design, um, you come up with some really good experimental control, some high internal validity, but, but because it minimizes confounds. But an AB design doesn't do squat for minimization of confounds. Nothing. Like, well, maybe a little bit, but nothing worth speaking of. It's a garbage design when it comes to the ability to detect um, effects, right? It's a cool design that you might use in research or in practice. Okay, so, oh, we got our baseline and we implement a change. Or so we have a baseline and we implement change. Great. Congratulations. You implemented it. You don't know if that change is the result of your independent variable or not. Um, but you can, at least you got the change in the real world, right? Um, in an experiment, that's not good enough. It's not going to get you published just to show an A-B design. It's not going to get you the level of control that you need to determine if that intervention at that phase change was actually what's causing whatever change you see during that B condition. And this is why we go to things like AB, AB designs or BAB designs or multiple baseline designs or um, changing criteria. All these other design types out there allow us to um, draw some more conclusions about cause and effect. So another note, <laughs> sorry, this is, this, this video is going to be full of notes. Another note is about cause and effect. In our field, we don't use the term cause and effect. We use the term functional relation. I tend to use cause and effect when I'm like teaching about it initially, because it helps you thinking about what a functional relation means. And here's why is, is event a functionally related to event B. 
There you go. In other words, does event A cause event B? Um, the functional relation language is more, more accurate, believe it or not, than cause and effect um, because we can't ever completely rule out every single possible thing out there. So we just worry about whether or not something is functionally related. Um, so experimental design or experimental control comes about through the type of design you choose. Um, there's lots of different design types. We're going to get into a few of those, um, but we have to worry about a couple other things here. So um, the, the setting that you're in, obviously this setting. So we have different experimental settings. Um, it could be in a laboratory. It could be in the real world. Um, we talk about subjects, right? So um, I prefer the term subjects as opposed to participant, but you can think about it as whatever you want. And then you can think about the single subject logic. The logic that we use in our experimentation um, is single subject. That does not mean we're studying one person only. You could study 50 people using a single subject approach. It's about an individual level of analysis. Okay, so you analyze people by themselves. You have five people in a study, you analyze each one of them behavior for their own sake, each, each person's behavior for its own sake. We don't aggregate it, we don't average, we don't do those sorts of things. That's the single subject logic. Um, let's see, so minimization of confounds, dependent variables. This is the thing that you're measuring. What's it dependent upon? It's dependent upon the independent variable. That's your intervention. Independent variables, interventions. Dependent variables, that's the behavior you're seeking change in. Right, so those are some of the basics, the core pieces of experimentation. I'm going to take you back in another video in a fair minute and talk about uh, parametric analysis because that seems to be an issue in our field with people understanding what parametric analysis is. We'll find a better spot to do that in and we'll come back shortly. Thank you. If you like the way it is and you want it to continue, what it is, what it was, and what it shall be. If you want that, then like, subscribe, and share, please, because that's the only way it's going to happen. I promise. That's it. That's all you get. More. You want videos? Like, subscribe, share. Please. Please.